My name is Eric Ash. I was the rector at Imperial from 1985 to 1993. What makes Imperial special to you? Well, I think probably what makes it special to many other people. It's a place of enormous eminence, has been so for a century. But one thing that makes it particularly special is its location. There are not very many universities that uh, are in the centre of a major city. And I think that's an enormous attraction to getting the brilliant staff that Imperial has and to getting the students. You don't think it's a disadvantage for students in time? It is also a disadvantage. It's more expensive. Mm. But um, I think a lot of students would rather have the joys of London rather than being stuck somewhere in the country where you need a bus ride to get to the nearest cinema. So Imperial still has that magic that brought you to us in the first place? I think it does. Of course, ex-rectors are not as much in touch um, as when you're on the site. But my feeling is that Imperial College is still very much on an upward path and that it is regarded so by the world at large. As an outside observer, then you, you still have quite a view of what's happening. Yes, indeed, but it is the observation from the outside, which is different from being involved with it. Can you tell me how it felt to be in charge of this world-renowned organisation? Well, I suppose daunting is the first word that comes, comes to mind. Um, the other thing that I was quite conscious of is that in the past, rectors had been pretty eminent chaps before they appeared on the scene here, and that's been true of my two successors too. Um, my most important managerial role before coming was to head up a small department at University College, a very eminent department, but a small department. And so changing to running a very large institution was quite a step to take. But it must have been a, if it was a challenge, it must have been one you, well, you were ready for. Well, I think I was ready for it. I certainly enjoyed it. I mean, in one sense, it's not as difficult as it sounds. In a big organisation, you have more noughts at the end of all the figures than in a small one. But what you actually have to do is in many ways similar. The big difference is that you can't know everybody. And I think the personal contact between the rector and at least the senior staff is of vital importance. Did you develop that yourself? Um, my wife and I tried very hard to develop that. We did spend quite a lot of effort on the entertaining side. We had um, what we called bistro dinners every fortnight on a formula where we invited um, six couples from the college and six from what we called the real world. <coughs> and um, I think that really worked very well. In all our entertainment, we always um, invited partners. And it was the summer fairs that you and Claire started? Well, that was entirely my wife's was doing the summer fair and then the winter fair. But they, they were fairly major occupations for her. Mm. And indeed, I think she became almost a full-time, though totally unpaid member of the staff here. So um, the hub was prob your idea and Claire's idea to make fe people feel that there was somewhere at the centre of college because it lacked a heart. Is that the case? I think that was part of the idea. But the other motive for setting up Hub, and it was entirely my wife's idea, um, was to provide a centre for visiting professors. It's terribly important for any university to be able to deal appropriately with visiting professors who can add so much vitality to the work of the college. And so she was concerned with where they live. She spent a lot of time doing up the flats and the that were available in the college and that sort of thing. So you think you achieved that objective and made people Well, feel? one never achieves any objective totally, but I think uh, she made a, an impact on it, yes. Thank you. Um, what major changes did you wish to see made during your term? Well, you, the way you asked the question, of course, suggests that I had an agenda when I came, which I, I really didn't. But as I went along, the main changes that I wanted to see were, first of all, um, to enhance, further enhance, the research and teaching excellence in the college. 
um, in many places it was supremely uh, effective at the time, one or two other places it was not so. My predecessor, Lord Flowers, said to me that the staff at Imperial College are a set of arrogant buggers, but they have an awful lot to be arrogant about. <laughs> and I must say that was a very good judgment. Nevertheless, there were some places where I think some additional effort was needed in, in order to bring the staff fully to the task of research and teaching. And a very important factor was the recognition, which I think Imperial College had not fully made at the time that I came, and that is the supreme importance of attracting the best research students and the best undergraduate students. In a university, it's the quality of the students which is fundamental. If you get excellent students, you will attract excellent staff. And in some departments, when I came, this hadn't really been appreciated. But by the time you left, you felt it had? I hope so. I made uh, recruiting a very major aspect of the work of departments and uh, had a personal contact with the, um, the admissions tutors in, in all of the departments. So can you describe the development of the college during your term as an adjunct question? Well, I suppose the most important developmental step was taking on a medical school, Indeed. St. Mary's Hospital Medical School. Um, this, to me, was highly desirable. So much of the science in the college as it was, certainly in the life sciences, but also in physics, had a direct link to medical needs and medical um, potential medical therapies that it seemed to me sensible for the college to develop a medical school. Um, oddly enough, the management of St. Mary's was all in favour of this. The college was really very ambivalent about it, and it was quite a major struggle um, to eventually get the agreement of my colleagues in the college uh, to take this step. Did you expect the students to integrate in any way? I hoped that they would in due course, and indeed in due course they did. Um, but it took a while. Um, after all, the college still had three constituented colleges, City and Guilds, Royal College of Science, Royal School of Mines, and even they hadn't fully integrated, That's even true. though they'd had the best part of a century to do it. So these tribal loyalties take a, take a while to uh, overcome. But certainly within about three years, um, there was an awful lot of connection between the unions, between the students, in sport, in music, and in work. I was going to ask you if you thought that it was sport that brought people together particularly, but then again, music has always been important here, and I believe it's important to you, isn't it? Music was certainly one of the things that um, I was very happy to develop whilst I was here. It all comes down to the musician in residence, Richard Dickens. Um, but in my first year, I arranged for him to double the amount of time that he spent in the college. And what he's achieved during my time and since is really quite remarkable. I mean, the Imperial College uh, Symphony Orchestra is really a fully professional orchestra. I would uh, challenge anyone to listen to a CD of one of their recordings and um, n not be aware of the fact that it was, in fact, a professional orchestra. Um, do you, did you achieve all you wished to achieve? Of course not. <laughs> One never does. <clears throat> um, but I think I achieved uh, a number of the things that I wanted to achieve. The other major um, development during my time was the creation of the management school. Um, there were two uh, departments who formed the basis of it. But it really wasn't a very, they were both very specialised departments and in no way um, were they uh, playing the role of a proper management school. Um, by the time I left, that had been achieved. And in the meantime, um, the management school is now rated as one of the best in the UK and certainly somewhere in the top league of world business schools. So you, you feel some sort of satisfaction about yes, helping I, that on its way? 
Yes, I, I, I do. Um, one of my great hopes for the business school was that there would be lively interaction between the graduates in the, in the management school and the scientific and engineering departments. And that has happened to some extent, uh, but it hadn't happened as much as I would have liked to have seen by the time I left. Perhaps it has now. With the entrepreneurs, you obviously keep an eye on what's happening even now. Yes, to, uh, yes, I, uh, I, I have a, a contact with one of the spin-off companies in the, in the department and indeed with another company that I'm involved in we are currently using facilities in civil engineering so I have some contact in, in that sense but the sort of thing I meant in addition was to have PhD students who would be jointly supervised by the management school and by a science or engineering department and I think there's been rather little of that so far but I think it's an open goal and I would like to see that develop further so, in, in your view, the foundations you laid, how, how well have they been built on? Well, I think very well. I mean, there's, by the time I left, the last research assessment exercise, um, which is sort of the pecking order for research pecking order in the UK, we came a whisker behind Cambridge and ahead of Oxford. And that position has been maintained in the, the last RE and I'm sure will be maintained again in the next one, if indeed there is to be another one. So in, in that respect, I think uh, I'm really very happy with the state I left the college in and how it's progressed since. The big development in the meantime has of course been the growth of the medical school, which is, I believe now, the biggest in the country. It has developed to being something like half the size of the, the whole of Imperial College, and it is very successful both in research and in teaching. Well, your taking in St Mary's, as it were, was the foundation for that, wasn't it? Yes, St Mary's was the foundation for that, but um, it was very much Lord Ox Oxborough who uh, fought the, the good fight of getting various other schools of the university into the Imperial College Medical School, notably Hammersmith. That was a great achievement. How do you think college was seen by the outside world? Academics, politicians, schools, government departments, and also internally students and, alum and alumni? Well, that's a very big question. Um, let's take alumni first, because you, you asked what had changed during my time. When I came, there was no alumni organization. And when I asked who, where are alumni, I was shown a card file with a few hundred names in it, including, oddly enough, mine, um, but with an address that would never have reached me. So we really started that process um, at ground zero. Um, by the time I left, I believe we had something like 70,000 names on a database, and we had established uh, contacts with a lot of groups all over the world. Um, I believe that the alumni think extremely highly of Imperial College. They are very proud to have been here. And I think this um, development of bringing the alumni back into the college, which was again uh, very much pursued by Ron Oxborough after my time, um, has been very successful. But it was you who started up the alumni days when you brought people in, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. Um, and we started uh, a number of initiatives one I will always remember is um, we had a degree ceremony in Singapore because there were a lot of Singaporean alumni who'd never been through one, so we thought it'd be nice to have one. And the very first person that I gave a degree to at that time was the then Minister of Education in Singapore. That's I think quite that, a coup. I think that must have been a first. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Um, alumni... Now, did you, when you um, courted alumni, it was because you believed that they should be still interested in college. Was there also some notion that they would support college in kind or financially in some way? Absolutely. Kind? That was, was one of the aims. It had to be a long-term aim. You can't really change um, the views of that society overnight. 
But um, if I compare it with the United States, you will find that uh, many universities, um, if they look at the class of, let's say, 40 years ago, you will find that 90% of them would be annual givers. I doubt that there's any university in the UK that is as yet up to 10%. So it's a long road, um, but I think progress is being made. And of course, you occasionally get uh, major gifts from alumni in a most unexpected way. Indeed. So um, as to the other um, cohorts that I mentioned. Who, what do you well, think? politicians. Um, very hard to know what politicians think. And any, anyway, they do change with astounding rapidity. If you look at the number of ministers of education, secretaries of state for education we've had in the last few years. But I believe that they think extremely highly of Imperial College. And they were grateful to us for embarking on the task of getting closer to industry than had been the case beforehand. I do think we during my time made a major step forward in spending more time with industry, doing more research with industry and uh, collaborating on all sorts of levels with industry. It was not an easy thing to do at first. For one thing, industry, rather bizarrely, didn't understand that universities needed overheads. Um, they thought if they pay the direct costs that would be enough. Well, if you just accept direct costs, you go bust. And we had a job in explaining this uh, to uh, a number of industries. Um, one of the problems that we had is that they tended to say that, well, Cambridge doesn't need any overheads, why do you? Well, the answer to that, of course, is screamingly obvious. Cambridge is immensely rich, was and is, and we were immensely poor, and I think to some extent still are. Um, I might just, on, on that point, say that the last year when, of the RAE, when, as I've already said, we came second to Cambridge and head of Oxford, we were judged to be 72nd in financial strength in the cohort of universities in, in the UK. And I think one of the brilliant achievements of Imperial College, then and now, is how extraordinarily well we've done, in spite of the fact that we have so little backing by way of an endowment. Um, it is amazing that we can keep up with the Oxfords and the Cambridges of this world, but we can and do. Is that partly because funding <coughs> systems have changed? Are there more people funding? I and mean, we don't just have to rely on have key or something now. We, there are a lot of other bodies that give grants. Do you think? Well, I, I think that is, that is true to some extent, but I think most of the additional funding that a place like Imperial College gets from industry and other sources is money in and money out. It energizes the research process, but it doesn't actually pay any bills, like the heating, the lighting, uh, or the staff. Or, uh, no, but that en energizing is is a good thing anyway. Oh, it's absolutely it, vital. And it, absolutely vital, yes. Um, what about schools? We had the outreach programme, the Pimlico Connection. Well, that's something which was started at Imperial College well before my time. And I thought it was a marvellous initiative. And it continues to this day. And I'm glad to say quite a few other schools have copied it. Uh, quite a few other universities have copied this, this idea. But. Um, it is still very much needed, and uh, we all know that one of the big problems in the UK is a shortage of physics and chemistry and mathematics teachers. I think the Pimlico initiative is one way to overcome the shortages that we've experienced there. Does anything stand out in your memory about your time as rector? Well, lots of things. It was eight years of my life. <laughs> Um, perhaps going back to the merger with St. Mary's in 1988, we had a celebration when it had been achieved. Um, we had lots of speeches in the Great Hall, lots of music. There was, for example, a Bartok violin duet performed by one uh, lady who was a student at 
St. Mary's and one man who was a student here. They were both brilliant. And uh, Princess Anne came along and graced the occasion and made a marvelous speech. So everybody was happy, except that on that day, the flag of St. Mary's was flown at half-mast. Oh, that was a shame. So that, that is some indication of the problem that we had Indeed. to make St. Mary's feel at home in Imperial College. But you do think we achieved that in the end? I, I think we did. It took a while. I made sure that right from day one, the signage everywhere would say Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine. Mm -hmm. More recently, the present rector has abbreviated this to Imperial College, and I think he's absolutely right to have done this. But at the time, it was very important to have medicine uh, on the flag, so to speak. When I arrived at Imperial College, some people had the bright idea that perhaps we ought to sell up the place and move to a greenfield site. My instant reaction to this was totally negative. We would cease to be Imperial College, lose all the advantages of being in central London, being close to Parliament, being close to ministries. But the estates was a major problem, both here and in Silwood Park and some of the other properties that we owned. And frankly, at that time, it was run in a somewhat amateurish way. So one of the things that we really had to do during my time was to bring the estates business up to a more professional level. Uh, in this, I was enormously helped by Sir Stuart Lipton, who joined the Estates Committee, or chaired the Estates Committee, and he really um, brought the professionalism that we needed into the college. Oh, Sir Stuart Lipton is a major developer in London um, who is, has had very major jobs in uh, design and in architecture in London. And you, you felt that that made a huge difference to the... It made an enormous the... difference. He is a total professional. Uh, he was involved with building projects which are maybe a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than anything that we had. Um, the other thing that we did during my time is we thought there was a need for having a college architect. And um, we asked Sir Norman Foster uh, whether he would be prepared to do this, and I'm glad to say he was. And he has created the main college plan um, with which we are still, I think, very much in tune at the moment. This plan uh, also covered quite a lot of the rest of the area, didn't it, of South, of South Kensington, including the other institutions? Well, we, we tried, actually, to have a, uh, a plan for Albertropolis, as it was called. Um, I don't think it ever really quite came off. Um, I mean, one of my suggestions was that they should bury the traffic that goes on Exhibition Road. Um, in Paris they do this. When they don't like traffic above the ground, they produce a tunnel. But people thought there was no chance of getting the funding that would be needed for doing that. And so I think the development of Albertropolis has been a bit bitsy. Um, but the ba basic site plan that Norman Foster provided for Imperial College has been enormously helpful. I was a student at Imperial College. I left a third of a century before I arrived as rector. And I believe in my class in electrical engineering of about 40, there were two women, one of whom left after the first year. Um, Imperial College was almost devoid of having women students at that time. When I arrived in 1985, the situation had improved greatly. We had about a thousand students, but that was still under 20% of the total. And one of my aims was to try and rectify this rather absurd ratio. I'm glad to say that by the time I left, we did have 2,000 students, 2,000 women students, partially through the merger with St. Mary's, but very much through a great deal of evangelical work done by uh, my colleagues and myself in various schools to try and explain to women, to girls, students, that physics, chemistry, engineering, medicine were highly appropriate careers for women. 
the battle is still not quite won. It'll be won when the ratio is one to one, 50 percent, but I think there have been further improvements since my time. When I arrived at Imperial College, I asked, are we rich or poor? And I was told, frankly, we're relatively rich. And that was very comforting, except at that moment, formula funding was introduced into the university scene by Sir Peter Swinnerton Dyer. And it was judged that Imperial College had been overfunded and that we had to be pulled back. And we had to be pulled back by something like 10% over a period of three or four years. And this was quite hard to sustain. So I faced a significant financial problem um, really very shortly after arrival. My reaction to this was to delegate financial responsibility to the working level as far as it is possible to do so. And I wanted heads of departments to be responsible for the funding of their department and to ensure that they emerge at the end of every year in the black. In order to do this, you need to have some methodology for distributing the money that we receive from government um, amongst the departments. And we evolved such a methodology. We evolved a formula for funding. And I remember a heads of departments meeting where I explained what had been arranged and I thought it would all work by democracy and that people would accept it. Well, they didn't. Um, we had a rather heated meeting. Fortunately, we had invited our partners for dinner that evening, so we had to stop at some stage. I asked heads of departments whether they wanted to carry on on a Saturday or whether they would be prepared to delegate responsibility to a small number of their colleagues. Happily, they agreed to do the latter. I remember David Main, who was then head of electrical engineering, uh, was one very valuable member of this committee. And to cut a very long story very short, they evolved a formula for funding which made everybody approximately equally unhappy. And by that time, I thought we'd achieved what we needed to achieve. Um, I did say to heads of departments two things. One, we would change the formula by very little from one year to the next. And we would tell them about the changes several months before the new year started. And on the whole, I think this worked really well. Heads of departments found that if they were in the black, there would be no problem about replacing staff that had um, resigned or retired. Uh, I would give my assent to it almost automatically. Whereas departments that failed to remain in the black, they would face a rather fierce debate on such issues when they arose. So I think it, it worked and I think it's still working. Did, did, were you surprised by the level of opposition that to autonomy almost by the uh, departments? Did they prefer that um, control was central so they didn't have to take responsibility? No, I think, I mean, I was surprised um, by the amount of initial opposition. Um, I described it as my days of innocence in the college. Um, but I do think heads of departments appreciated the, the sense of doing it this way. Um, uh, nobody can be entirely happy when there is a shortage of, of funds, but at least if a head of department knows where he stands or she stands, it's a great help. After I had left Imperial College, I remember reading an article by Matthew Paris about the gay movement within Imperial College and that gay students felt they were to some extent underprivileged. I wrote to him and told him that I was sure he was wrong. I know that when I came, Felix, the student magazine, um, had a survey of the number of students who regarded themselves as gay. And the answer in 1985 was zero. By 1987, 
there was an active gay and lesbian movement. And I think that battle had been very largely overcome. And I do not remember during my time thereafter that it was ever again a serious issue. And I don't think it is now either. I mentioned earlier the advantage for students for being in London. If they're interested, in addition to science, in the arts, in the theatre, in cinemas, in music, there is no better place on earth to be. The trouble is, it's quite difficult to find a place to live. And student residences has been one of the key issues for the college um, throughout the existence of the college. One of my hopes was that we would be able to increase the number of student residences um, so that students could remain in a hall of residence or in resident, college residential accommodation, if that's what they wanted to do, for most of the three or four years that they would be here at the college. It proved to be a very uphill task. We did have some successes. We were able to um, buy a whole series of houses in Ealing, um, which accommodated quite a large number of students and incidentally had the advantage that it was basically surrounded by a cemetery so the neighbours didn't complain about noise, which was one of the problems one can have with students in South Kensington. I do think it remains a major problem. I do think it would be a very worthwhile use of endowment funds as they come in. Um, we can compete with Cambridge in science, in research, and certainly in teaching. We can't compete in student residences. By now they have something like 100% residential accommodation for all undergraduate students. I think this remains a challenge. It was a challenge in my time. It remains one now. Imperial College is part of the University of London. I personally have a great admiration for what the University of London has achieved since it was initiated in 1827. It was the first university that accepted students who were not Church of England in their uh, faith, um, the first to accept women, certainly the first to give degrees to women, something like uh, 70 or 80 years before Cambridge got around to it, the first to accept engineering and fine arts as suitable topics for undergraduate education. They did a marvellous job in spreading university uh, ideas and ideals to many other colleges in the UK, colleges that have since become universities in their own right, and many universities abroad. But by the middle of last century, it was no longer totally obvious what their role was. And indeed, Imperial College, in a sense, ceased to be um, an organic part of the University of London sometime in the 60s, um, because at that point, Imperial College became separately funded by the government rather than funded through the University of London. By the time I arrived, that process was almost totally complete. And it was really quite difficult to see what the role of the University of London was. And we had occasions when the University of London um, proved to provide some obstacles, for example, for the appointment of particular professors, because they had their own um, list of experts that they could include on the selection committee for professors. In the end, we always prevailed, and I think I can say that throughout my time at Imperial College, nothing that happened at in, in the University of London ever had any direct influence on what we were up to. It was a ceremonial relationship, but it did seem to me, at least at one time, that there might be a need to break even the ceremonial relationship. Um, I hear that the present rector, Sir Richard Sykes, is now taking the step that Imperial College will in fact uh, cease to be part of the University of London. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is no disrespect to the University of London, 
which can continue in a smaller way to do some very useful things. But I think it is a correct recognition of the historical development of Imperial College. Didn't you um, start some movement about an Imperial College degree in your day? Did you not do something? We, we did examine the possibility um, of awarding Imperial College degrees. Um, of course, they were, in any case, Imperial College degrees. We set the examinations, we appointed the examiners. It was merely the, the formality that they, it came under the banner of the University of London, and it did seem illogical, and we did explore the possibility of, of making that change, which has now happened. You ask about spin-off companies, and I think they are a major and important development uh, for the college. When I arrived, there had been very little of this sort of thing happening. And when it did happen, it didn't involve the college at all. There are examples of some companies that had their origin within Imperial College, um, from which Imperial College has not benefited in any way. Now, the law is very clear that if an employee of the college makes an invention, that invention belongs to the college. And I think this had not been fully appreciated before my time. I was enormously helped in making progress on this front by recruiting Dr. David Thomas, uh, who was at that time working in government service. And he was instrumental in getting a logical structure for how one can deal with inventions created by employees of the college by the academic staff. Um, we arranged a system whereby the invention of a, made by a particular colleague would, if it resulted in royalties, that these royalties would be split between the college and the inventor on a formula basis so that the inventor got most of it um, for small income on royalties and the college got most of it if it turned out to be a very large invention. I think most people thought this was fair and it was successfully implemented. But we did have to convince some of my colleagues that the previous system had not been fair to the college and uh, would need to be changed. In the meantime, um, there are now something like 50 or more spin-out companies from the college some of these have now gone through an initial public offering, and so they are public companies. Many of them will probably take that step sometime in the foreseeable future. But it amounts to a big contribution to UK industry, a big contribution eventually to the college, and already it is in fact leading to um, some additional income to the college, which is so highly desirable and needed. But above all, it encourages both staff and students to think in entrepreneurial terms. We do not want, I did not want everyone in the college to become an entrepreneur. If you're working on string theory in cosmology, um, it is inappropriate. But if you're working on um, in biochemistry or in electrical engineering, there are great opportunities uh, for entrepreneurial uh, outlets for the creative process without in any way damaging the research function that is of course our main purpose. One of the first problems that I encountered at Imperial College was the financial structure and I mean the, the actual accountancy um, and, and the way the figures were assembled. Um, it had rather grown like Topsy. The financial structure was in the hands of some rather small computers. And whenever the college grew, they added one more computer and joined it up. And the whole structure really didn't survive um, and eventually really collapsed. Um, I think perhaps the absolute low point of our financial uh, situation at that time was when my wife was running a summer party and wanted to buy balloons and it turned out 
that the supplier would not accept an order from Imperial College, we had to pay cash in order to get the balloons. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, the problem was solved fairly rapidly. We got new computers. Uh, the computing department were extremely helpful in, in this respect. Um, and within a few weeks, I think, we got out of that particular problem. Um, but it still was not entirely easy to have a financial system that worked particularly for the expanding research interests of the college and the complexities involved in having mergers with St. Mary's. But by the time I left, I felt that the financial system did have the integrity that we really needed. The relationship between the rector and the students is, of course, of some importance, at least to the rector. I'm not sure quite how important it is to the students. Um, I must say, I enormously enjoyed the contact which I had with the sabbatical officers throughout the time that I was the rector here. Um, we collaborated a great deal with the student body. Um, my wife was particularly interested also in welcoming all the overseas students, which we did every year. We had a special session with them and to explain what it was like to be a student here. And then my wife and I doled out ice creams to each one of the, the students, which they thought I think was rather odd, at least coming from some parts of the world. Um, I was always very keen to support student activities on the sporting side and certainly on, on the music side. Of course, part of the role of students is to stick pins into the rector. And indeed, throughout my time, this was done with a considerable degree of enthusiasm. Um, Felix, of course, the student magazine, plays a leading role in doing this. Um, there's only one thing which ever annoyed me in Felix, and that is when they published anonymous letters. I pleaded with them to stop doing that because I said this is a free society, nobody need to be ashamed of their views, and there's no reason why they shouldn't be attributed uh, to you if you want to project them. I don't think I quite persuaded them. Perhaps that has happened now. I hope it has. Music has been one of the exhilarating parts of life at Imperial College. Um, one of the things that we achieved during my time was to invent a new degree, a degree which we called Physics with Music. It was a four-year degree. It involved students going through the normal physics degree course at Imperial College and going through a musical performance course at the Royal College of Music next door. In order to get in, the student had to be good enough as a performer to get into the Royal College of Music, good enough as a physicist to get into our physics department. So naturally, there were not very many of those in any one year. Um, but every year there have been some, and I think this is a remarkable achievement between ourselves and the Royal College of Music. There's one other thing which we did do, and that is those students who were almost that good but not quite that good, we have arranged that they can have professional lessons at the Royal College of Music. And there is a financial arrangement so that they can, in fact, um, obtain these lessons at, a, I think, a zero rate or, or at least a reduced rate. And I think there are quite a number of students who avail themselves of that privilege. And I hope that will continue forever and ever. The task of being a rector is multifarious. We've discussed some of the problems. The main, most important ones, of course, are to support the academic excellence of the college. But one is also very much involved in day-to-day -day activities of all sorts. Um, I certainly found it was a seven-day-a-week job, uh, which I enjoyed. This is not by way of a complaint, but one certainly finds that one is talking to an awful lot of people a lot of the time. 
And that was, to my mind, highly desirable. Um, I believe that uh, the more people the rector can talk to on a personal basis, the easier it is for the rector to explain policy issues and have them penetrate uh, uh, through, through the, the staff. Um, one of the tools which I found extremely helpful was email. Now, speaking in 2006, that hardly sounds revolutionary. I had the greatest difficulty in persuading people to go over to email, um, or to, uh, many of my colleagues to go over to email, probably around about um, 1987. Um, I then instituted a system whereby I would communicate with heads of departments only by email. And that really did bring home the message that this is the way to go. Of course, it's a two-edged sword. I remember when we had a problem, which I don't need to go into details on, but something which upset a lot of people. I got 82 email messages um, from various colleagues. I replied to each and every one of them. Um, and I think that's the great advantage of email, that you can actually do this. I might add that when we'd solved the problem, um, everybody was happy and the number of email messages I got on this subject was zero. But that goes with a job.